Greetings and welcome to Sports 101, the show that discusses sport beyond the X's and O's. Here we like to expand our conversation to include history, past, present, as well as in the making. We also look at the game from a people, places, and cultural perspective. I'm your host, Jamar Hart. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Coach underscore Hart 412 and Facebook under the name Jamar Hart. Make sure you get social with Sports 101 and a litany of other shows on Sports Zone Chicago by following Sports Zone Chicago on Twitter at Sports Zone CHI, Facebook at Sports Zone Chicago, and Instagram at Sports Zone Chicago. Remember, Sports Zone Chicago is the world's only black owned sports talk app. You can watch and listen to my show, Sean and Maya in the Morning, and all the new shows that are coming up monthly as we speak. You can keep up with breaking sports news. If you miss something, please don't worry about it. Just download the YouTube app, search Sports Zone Chicago. But more importantly, the channel, excuse me, but more importantly, we want everyone to download our app. Our app can be found on the iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon stores. Now, this week, we would like to talk about Soul on Ice, African Americans in the NHL or the National Hockey League. In the past, we've done shows on the origins of hockey and how the um, former enslaved Africans moved to uh, Nova Scotia in Canada and invented hockey, as well as uh, modern day things such as the slap shot and the um, butterfly style that goalies use, as well as different movements um, that are still prevalent and um, or the f- format and foundation of today's modern hockey game. So this week we're gonna talk about, again, soul on ice. First time ever in NHL history, they have started an all-black line in this league. A big, historic moment tonight. It's a step in the right direction, and, you know, my goal, I think, you know, Wally's goal and Smitty's goal and any uh, players of color in, in this league, obviously, we want to uh, showcase our, our sports, you know, your families or, or other people of color. So it's uh, it's definitely awesome to, uh, you know, be one of the guys who, were, uh, who was there for that. For me, it's cool just so the young black kids who play hockey who are younger can kind of see that and maybe get inspired by it. And maybe we can, you know, inspire like more black kids to just feel like they have a place in the game. First of all, they're on the NHL for a reason. They deserve to be here and they've worked their tails off to get here and to have them all together and have a little chemistry with the guys together. And, you know, as, as we move forward here as a league, you know, you hope it's not going to be a story anymore and it's just going to be you know, kind of the norm. I think it was a pretty cool moment for, for all those guys. Thank you. So again, you see in a video, um, the Tampa Bay Lightning, who were the uh, NHL champs, they had a forward line, which is the attacking players of uh, three players of African descent. That is Matthew Joseph, Jamel Smith, and Daniel Walcott. Um, they started, even though they lost that game, um, that was monumental for the NHL. Um, think of the Texas Western uh, Kentucky game where Texas Western was the first uh, team uh, during integration to play uh, black players and they beat the um, historic Kentucky team. Um, This can be the equivalent. Um, You heard the coach say at the end of the video, um, they all deserve to be there. They're all NHL players and the uh, continuity um, they had playing with each other. He hopes, you know, you see this more. So basically uh, what I got from that was he wants the NHL to kind of emulate the NBA uh, and other professional leagues um, and their uh, demographic makeup. Um, Joseph also stated it's a step in the right direction in regards to getting more people of African descent um, interested in hockey. He said his goal and the goal of many other players of color in the league is to show good sport to their families and other people of color. So right here is Anson Carter. Anson Carter is currently a hockey analyst for NBC Sports, and he's a former NHL forward. 
Um, he called Dot Lions' debut a significant moment for hockey, similar like I did uh, with the Texas Western Kentucky game. I um, mean, Carter's career, he scored uh, 421 points. That's 202 goals, 219 to sixth, and 674 games for the Capitals, Bruins, Oilers, Rangers, uh, Los Angeles Kings, the Vancouver Canucks, the Columbus Blue Jackets, and retiring uh, in 2007 with the uh, Carolina Hurricanes. Um, this game was also Walcott's debut. Um, the 27-year-old left winger had one shot on goal of 10 minutes of ice time. Uh, he was selected by the Rangers in the fifth round, number 140 of the 200, uh, 2014 NHL draft and acquired in the trade by the Lightning on June 1st. Uh, for a seventh round pick in the 2015 draft. Uh, Walcott stated there was a lot of ups and downs for him growing up. Um, he had left hockey for a while to play football. Again, one of the things that we'll unpack later is uh, the cost of hockey. So a lot of people go to more traditional sports. Um, another factor is, is all their friends are playing football and basketball um, and they don't want to be the only kid that's you know playing hockey. You have to get bust a long way and the equipment is almost twenty thousand dollars so he had actually left hockey for a while went back to football and then i had a clause by wake up the hockey ranks and uh he was really proud of himself to step on the nhl ice for the first time um joseph uh he's a nut he's a 24 year old right winger he scored 19 points um last year um 12 goals seven assists and 56 games for the lightning um smith uh, was a center on that line. He's 27 years old. He played 11 min around 11 and a half minutes in that game, and that was his fifth game that season. He finished uh, with three assists, and he is the older brother of Detroit Red Wings right wing uh, Giovanni Smith. Um, I know you guys in Chicago are adamant, you know, hockey uh, fans as well. Or you know, I used to be, um, you know, being from Pittsburgh. I would love to see Chelios and his boys play. Um, Again, you know, growing up, I get to see Lemieux and Yager and uh, a lot of great players like that. Um, at that point, was being marketed more to Europe and uh, Canada, um, but not the black players. But again, we'll unpack that a little later. Um, in the locker room, these guys didn't know they were starting until moments before the game, until the lineup was put on the board. And that's what the Panthers forward, Anthony DeClaire, said, who's also black, but he didn't start that game. He said it was great to see it and was so proud. Um, in addition to the three black players, Tampa Bay also has two black coaches um, whose organization, if you look at right now, will be a model of diversity within the NHL and most likely uh, the NFL. Um, they have a video coach named Nigel Caron and their goaltending coach is Franz Jean. Um, the all black line had been extremely rare in professional hockey um, since brothers Herb and Ozzy Carnegie, along with Manny McIntyre, um, they skate on the all black uh, line uh, for Sh uh, Sherbrooke. Uh, Sherbrooke is a team located in the province of Quebec and their senior hockey league in Canada. But this was in 1948 and 49. Um, they had been playing together since the 1940s, so they had a lot of camaraderie. Again, at this time, remember uh, our past episode, we talked about that the racism that uh, People experienced in Nova, Coast, Nova Scotia and beyond where hockey was invented. And um, they had uh, they got priced out of the game, but uh, the Maritimers Hockey League. And um, it began to spread throughout Canada. Um, so these McIntyre brothers was playing at a time uh, right around before it was uh, going to be closed uh, for those individuals of African descent. Um, there's a team also in the United Hockey League which will be like double A. Um, the triple A is the American Hockey League or the AHL. So the United Hockey League will be double A. And I'm just using baseball standards in case anyone isn't familiar with the hockey uh, uh, network in the United States. So Flint, they featured an all black line in 1998 with Khalil Thomas, Jason Payne, who we'll talk about later on, and Nick Forbes. Um, it's funny because Thomas's son, uh, on March 22nd of this year, Keel Thomas, he played on a line with forward Quentin Byfield, 
who we also talked about, who was one of the uh, diaper dandies um, in our former episodes. He was a number two pick in the 2020 NHA draft by the Los Angeles Kings, uh, a black man, and Devontae Smith Pelly for Ontario of the American Hockey League. And that's the Kings minor league affiliate. So um, Smith Pelly is in and out of, think of it like a 10 day contract with the NBA. Um, he's in and out the NHL sometimes, but they got a lot of time on his day on that line. Um, John Paris Jr. He, he became the first black coach to win a professional hockey championship when he got in Atlanta of the International Hockey League or IHL to the Turner Cup in 1994. So that would be like a single A. And he had tried unsuccessfully for years to put together an all black unit. That's uh, three forwards and two defensemen while coaching junior and minor league hockey. So he had tried to be a trailblazer in this Atlanta area, but it didn't quite take off yet on the back end. He was able to get uh, forwards of African descent, but couldn't get um, all black lineup, including the goalie. Um, Paris stated, when you see something, it stays. It's important because it will promote the growth of the game even more within the various cultural communities. And in larger cultural communities, if you watch a game and you see a multitude of different ethnic groups within it, it just uh, it basically becomes a normality after a while, and that creates more attention to the game in a positive manner. So basically what he's saying is the NHL could grow if it was more um, feasible to the eye of these other ethnic groups to flock to other games to see individuals from their homeland and support them. Uh, if you look at the Yao Ming experiment when it first started in the NBA, the NBA gained uh, billions of viewers just because it's, uh, or millions of viewers, excuse me, because it's millions of people in China. And what if the NHL did something like that and had individuals from West Africa, East Africa, et cetera, the Caribbean, uh, you could see the same effect, except it will sweep um, different areas of the globe. Uh, this season was monumental for Tampa Bay. Again, the NHL struggled with diversity and player support from its fans um, the whole year. Um, about chants like that, again, to his ethnic background. And they were kind of making it clear that hockey isn't for everyone, and it's especially not for black people. But again, we know that's not the case as individuals of African descent uh, found at hockey in Nova Scotia. Um, Willie O'Ree, another trailblazer who had his share of ups and downs, became the NHL's first black player in 1958 when he took the ice for the Boston Bruins in a game against the the Canadians and face uh, similar racist abuse throughout his career. Um, Wayne Simmons, a former uh, for, uh, Toronto Maple Leafs forward, uh, was a, a playing against the Flyers in 2011 and had uh, bananas hurled at him. And this was an exhibition game that was played in London. Um, again, uh, Washington Capitals forward uh, Joel Ward. Um, he knocked the Bruins out of the 2012 playoffs with a game seven overtime winning goal. And for that, he faced a uh, countless barrage of racial abuse by Boston fans, not only in the uh, arena, but uh, several days after on social media just for scoring the winning goal. Um, New York Rangers prospect Keandre Miller, who was also of African descent, participated in what most we believe would be an ordinary question and answer session with fans on Zoom, but um, he was abused with racist taunts and messages. And this was a session just to get players out to the community. Um, 
Then we have former Calgary Flames forward, Akeem Alou, who was a Nigerian, and he talked about instances of racist abuse that he suffered during his career, career from teammates and even his own coach. And what Alou was talking about, there was a moment when he was in the AHL and his coach came in the locker room and um, called him the N-word and said, I'm tired of you listening to this, you know, N-word type music. Um you know, shaking your ass, you know, a lot of different uh, cultural uh, stereotypes and, and turn this off. And he said it in front of the whole team. Um, so that's, uh, uh, you know, a tragic experience. This is your own head coach talking to you in such fashion. Uh, pretty much diversity is uh, lacking. Um, there was other incidences this year that kind of triggered the NHL to make change, but it was due to um, politics. So um, when the Mil when Milky Bucks decided not to take the court on August 26th in protest of the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, they inspired players across leagues, professional and collegiate, not only in this country, but in the world, to take a pause from sports and do the same as them. But as basketballs, baseball, soccer balls, and tennis balls were put away, um, hockey pucks were not. Um, skaters from the Boston Bruins and Tampa Bay Lightning gathered at a, um, a ice center rink uh, in uh, Scotia Bank Arena uh, for beginning of game three. Um, this was the Eastern Conference semifinals and there was no mention of it the first game. So nothing happened in the outside world, and the NHL was in um, sort of like an NBA bubble where they didn't know of these incidents. Um, the NHL didn't move its slate of games. They completely ignored the incident. Instead, choosing to acknowledge what uh, Kenosha police did to Blake, um, eventually they did a 27-second moment of reflection before the Bruins and Lightning's game when a Dremotron lit up with uh, this uh, picture right here. They wanted hockey to be, quote unquote, their game and no diversity was uh, looked upon or they felt needed. Um, even that short display was more than the league spared for a game between the Avalanche and the Dallas Stars. Later that evening, 
again, it proceeded with no acknowledgement of those recent tragic events. Um, even though the league didn't do anything, some players took a stand, including retired goaltender Robert Luongo, but non-white players were also at the forefront as well. San Jose Sharks forward Evander Kane and Minnesota Wild defenseman Matt Doomba. Um, Kane is black and Doomba is of Filipino descent, were also strong advocators um, after this uh, tragic uh, murder. Um, Ali U tweeted in support um, the Nigerian in, to the NBA, WNBA, and Major League Baseball players. And he asked, I um, mean, pretty much called the NHL out, saying, where are you? Remember, Doomba is the first NHL player to take a knee during the playing of the Star Spangled Banner when he did so before a game in August. Um, even took to the airways in Vancouver to explain why he did that, to speak out against racism. And he also stated that it shouldn't always fall on the black players and other players of color. If the dominant society knows you're doing wrong, then um, you shouldn't be you have to t be told that. Um, Duba stated the white players in the NHL need to have answers for what they're seeing in society too and what they help perpetuate You know, on the ice. Remember, this is a game where you – People go to get drunk and see fights. Fighting is encouraged. At one point, each team had a goon that was simply there just to fight. Um, so um, there are some ways inroads can be made in this game. Um, but uh, where they stand and making a change, the NHL as a league is not doing very good. Uh, players in the Western Conference uh, faced the media on uh, August of 27th, and they announced the postponement of games that day and the next with a plan to resume the following day. Now, this is uh, pivotal because this is the Western Conference, so it would be more aligned into what was going on in Wisconsin, the East Coast. They just ignored it. Um, remember what they say about uh, Florida as well, how North Florida is a Confederate state and South Florida is the Caribbean. Um, that's a, a growing joke that if you've ever been to Florida, you will understand. But um, Tampa Bay is located uh, in North Florida, so there's a lot of connotations around why each team did what they did, including demographic, uh, political, and um, racial uh, backgrounds. Um, the announcement came from the Vegas Knights for Ryan Reeves and Avalanche for Pierre Edward Bellarmi, who are both black. Um, also Avalanche for Nazim Kadri came in, who was of Lebanese descent, and the Dallas Stars for Jason Hickman and Vancouver Canucks forward Bob Horvath, who are both uh, white. But all account, the action led by all these players was led by themselves and not the league. Again, the league didn't want to take any stance in this, and there's ample evidence that the NHL knows it has a racial problem. Um, why do they say that? Um, they started a hockey is for everyone campaign because uh, they knew the um, pigeonhole, how the sport was in and how it was looked, similar to NASCAR. So they started a campaign saying hockey is for everyone, uh, which is proof that they know that they have a problem. And they did this in Black History Month through a series of commercials, uh, which feature uh, no black players in 2020. So again, they made commercials in Black History Month stating hockey is for everyone, but didn't showcase any of his black players. Um, what they did do is they created a mobile um, touring history museum and it tells a story of the color hockey league. Again, this is invoking history that we taught in our previous uh, lesson. Um, the color hockey league was an all black league that formed in Nova Scotia in 1895. Remember after the civil war, a lot of individual, well, um, everyone of African descent was considered a freedman. And um, they were under the care of uh, Colonel Howard who ran the Freedmen's Bureau out of uh, Washington, DC. Um, which wasn't a quite district yet. It was still a big union uh, camp, army camp. So um, a lot of the freedmen or formerly enslaved Africans wanted to leave the United States. And those who had been leaving uh, through the northern portion of the Underground Railroad um, that settled in Nova Scotia um, created the modern game of uh, hockey. So in the museum, it talks about this and, um, and it was responsible for other modern day inventions that these uh, Africans uh, brought, which is the slap shot and the butterfly goalie stance. They go down on both knees 
and cover up as much space possible within the net. Um, the paper it produced in 2018 in conjunction with the Brookings Institute that acknowledged the demographics in North America are shifting and 44% of American millennials are non-white and that is going to grow higher and that's going to reach out beyond the scope of you know black people or individuals of Africa that said who want to become a tertiary so-called minority in the United States. So there's going to be more people of color coming in and with different births, interracial marriage, et cetera. Um, there's going to be more people that are non-white, which is going to uh, affect the landscape of hockey that they're fearing. Um, the reality is that the league's fans are overwhelmingly white and they skew conservative. They're very skewed on the conservative side and more wealthy than fans of other professional sports leagues as the tickets are much higher. Um, as support for the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, has waned um, uh, uh, a large portion of America, it's fair to assume that the waning among the NHL's uh, uh, largely white audiences as well, too, and minority representation in the league still remains on a minuscule level. Um, remember, less than 5% of the league's players are black or people of color and has hired only one black head coach out of the 377 total coaches in its 102 years of existence. Now, that one black coach did coach your Chicago Blackhawks. Um, the majority of the hockey fans also from these surveys, they found a Republican and have conservative values uh, based off of data received from the NHL and the surveys that they give out at games. Um, and again, they do not want diversity within hockey. Um, surveying a cohort and speaking with a bunch of current and former uh, black players and players of color within the NHL isn't waiting any longer for the league to act. So the players took it on their own um, outside of the league, just like in uh, Major League uh, Soccer, they formed, but the Major League Soccer actually supported them. So these players include Kane, Dumba, Alou, Kadri, and Wayne Simmons. They joined together to form the Hockey Diversity Alliance, or the HDA, this June, in an effort to, to stop the systematic racism within hockey, and revert diversity on all levels of the sport, and encourage more participants of African descent. Um, soon after the NHL heard it is they balked at the opportunity to show support for um, Black Lives and the HDA, and they issued a press release det detailing how it intends to upend racial inequities and they issued it in the NHL and hockey more broadly. So basically they, they issued a political statement that said nothing while the HDA had a main objective. Um, the HDA's uh, initial plan began when increasing the share of black personnel hired by the NHL and its members. Um, they also want these members, including the AHL, IHL, et cetera. And they also wanted more um, individuals of African descent at the executive level and hockey and non-hockey related issues. They also asked for increasing diversity in the league's workforce the HDA proposed that I should be tasked with selecting at least 50% of the NHL's Executive Inclusion Council. So the EIC is a council that's supposed to go over the racial um, ideas um, that the NHL has, um, open the doors for inclusion and diversity, but they haven't been doing a good job. So the HDA wants 50, half the seats of the council. They also asked for a group of team owners, presidents, and general managers whose mandate is to ensure diversity and inclusion efforts are taken seriously throughout the league. Um, by doing all these things, they would ensure the voices of black, indigenous, and racialized players are heard and they have an opportunity to help change the culture of the league and get more diversity in the National Hockey League. The HDA also asked the NHL to implement a mandatory anti-racism and a conscious bias training education program for all league employees. The HDA is committed to funding social justice initiatives that target racism and provide justice for Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities. Um, grassroots hockey development programs are required that increase access to hockey. Again, it's a very expensive sport and provide support to the biopic players at the youth level. So that's players of color. Um, that's the acronym that they use in the NHL 
and also have more anti-racism and unconscious uh, bias training. Not only in the NHL, but all hockey leagues. Um, so after this, the HDA issued this press release. The NHL and the NHL Players Association kind of changed their tune and they responded with a joint press release announcing its plans to do more anti-racism training, get more diversity, et cetera. Um, they also announced with the Players Association plans to work with the HDA to establish and administer a first of its kind grassroots hockey development program to provide mentorship as well as skill development for Bobic boys and girls in the greater Toronto area and with similar plans in different cities. Um, notably, the NHL did not commit to, to concrete numbers regarding the hiring of black executive, hockey personnel, non-hockey personnel, and increasing um, the diversity amongst players. Um, they did say they would uh, have outreach to children, though. So, however, um, what the NHL said is commissioning an outside audit of these efforts while working with the diversity uh, and ethics and sports our ties institute um and looking at their current employee pool it also didn't agree with the 50 percent of the board shares which is 100 percent white at this moment um the nsl's again this piecemeal commitment to the hda's proposal uh, particip participated at the end and between the two organizations so the hda is pretty much out there on their own they recently announced they will operate separately from the nhl stating the league is not prepared to make measurable commitments to end racism in hockey um, based off of, again, what they committed to and they focus on performing public relation efforts that are aimed at quickly moving past important conversations about uh, race that are needed so the game can grow. Again, um, the NHL doesn't put out to everyone um, who created hockey. So this is one of the mobile touring units right here that you see um, that the NHL bring to some games and it'll broadcast some uh, hockey players. Now I do have a brief segment in, in this mobile tour unit that talks about the history um, of hockey, including the Africans that invented it. Uh, but more importantly, they keep that information from the masses. Um, so this young lady right here with the gray hat on that is Renee Hess. Um, so in Canada, hockey is, again, that's their na the national sport. And Renee Hess, uh, she's a founder of the group called the Black Girl Hockey Club or the BGHC, uh, which was founded two years ago. And it's a support network for women of color who enjoy hockey. Um, the New York Times did a, a feature article on them. And in the series, they talked about the NHL and the need to include more people of color in his new co in committees so they can see true change happening. Because again, um, the African uh, presence in hockey in Canada is big. It's always been that way, um, but that's not marketed. So the same way like football, basketball, or big hair, baseball in the Dominican Republic, hockey in Canada. Now they also play football and other sports too, but uh, hockey is a national sport. Um, the BGHC launched recently a campaign called Get Uncomfortable, and that aims truly at to develop a comprehensive set of recommendations on entities involved in hockey at all levels, um, meaningfully contributing to the dialogue and moving against discrimination and oppression of biopic communities in this modern society. Um, again, their campaign's ultimate goals are to make hockey a welcome space for black girls as, and black boys, as well, as, as well as others in the biopic communities, increase diversity and employment at all levels of sport, and educate hockey world on the history, as well as the issues of social justice and allyship, which centers uh, black women of color, uh, biopic uh, leaders, and anti-racism experts. Um, now, this is one of the few examples right here. This is Kim Davis. She's the NHL's executive vice president of social impact and growth of initiatives, and she's over some legislative affairs. She is black, and she's been instrumental in expanding 
the hockey is for everyone campaign. Remember, we talked about that campaign. It's pretty much lipstick. Um, and the New York Times spoke with Hess, and she's enjoying and bringing a new perspective to all dimensions of our inclusion efforts. So again, basically, uh, she's involved with the lipstick campaign that's not actually doing any focus work to get this done. Again, um, you had a group of players branch off from the league. Uh, one positive change the NHL could bring about is subsidizing uh, rank fees and equipment costs to leagues as well as um, other people of color. Um, similar to how Major League Baseball has sponsored the Jackie Robinson League. You know, Jackie Robinson West is known for its run in the Little League World Series. The NHL could do this as well. Um, hockey is the most expensive youth sport, and some families spend as much as $20,000 a year on equipment, league fees, and travel. In the United States, where the wealth gap between white and black families is wide as it was in the 1960s, um, that barrier is a large barrier to entry and a big reason why hockey is mostly played by individuals of European descent in the United States. And you add to that the lack of diversity and inclusion is mirrored in the racial makeup in the NHL, both on and off the ice. You can see why um, there's a lack of representation. That's why we need to get more people acclimated to the history, um, knowing that you created hockey should give you a sense of pride to go out there and play it and excel in it knowing that uh, your ancestors created this game in Canada. Uh, when Jacob Blake was shot in the back seven times by the Kenosha police, it didn't quite register with the majority of players in the NHL, nor as coaches, nor as personnel, um, until players in other leagues and the black players within the NHL uh, forced it to register. Um, I'd like to take a quick break, and when we come back, We'll talk about some coaching of administrative um, individuals that are pioneers in NHL. This is Sports 101. I'm your host, Jamar Harp. We'll be right back. Please stop and listen because this important message may directly apply to you or someone dear to you. Several thousand African American former full time CPS teachers were unfairly terminated starting in the mid 90s and continuing to the 2000s. If you are one of those many former CPS teachers who was unjustly terminated, or if you are the immediate relative of a now deceased unjustly terminated former CPS teacher, you may may qualify to participate in a lawsuit at no upfront cost to you. Please call 773-580-7183 immediately for more information. That's 773-580-7183. Do not delay. Act today because time is of the essence. That's 773-580-7183. 773-580-7183. Welcome back. Again, I'm Jamar Hart, and this is Sports 101, the show that discusses sport beyond the X's and O's. Again, we look at the game from a people, places, and cultural perspective through the historical lens of in the past, present, as well as in the making. Please get social with Sports 101 and a litany of other Sports Zone Chicago shows by following Sports Zone Chicago on Twitter at Sports Zone CHI, Facebook at Sports Zone Chicago, and Instagram at Sports Zone Chicago. Remember, subscribe to the YouTube channel, search Sports Zone Chicago, but more importantly, download the Sports Zone Chicago app. The Sports Zone Chicago app can be found in the iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon stores.
uh, leagues as he was named the current head coach of the Cincinnati AHL team yesterday. Again, the minority coaching tree in professional hockey is growing more branches. Nearly half a dozen teams from the minor leagues to the NHL hired coaches of color um, since the 2018-19 season. Yesterday, Jason Payne was hired by the ECHL Cincinnati Cyclones, making him the only black head coach in North American professional hockey next this upcoming season. Payne, who was 45, was promoted from assistant coach as the Cyclones head coach Matt Thompson was hired by the Providence Bruins of the AHL. So his former head coach went up to Triple A. Now he's a head coach of a Double A team. Payne, who grew up in Toronto, had a 14-year pro career as a player, making it as far as to the AHL, which again is a Triple A affiliate of the National Hockey League. Payne said there weren't many black coaches as I was coming up, but when there were, you took notice. Payne hopes his hiring will help inspire uh, many others. Anyway. It's important for younger players to see familiar faces, Payne stated, saying maybe I could be the guy behind the bench. Maybe I could be someone in hockey operations. Maybe I could be a video coach. Payne told ESPN, but just by seeing black coaches, they see that it's an opportunity. The more you see the faces, the more it sheds light on the opportunities that are possible and people will reach for them. Uh, Payne's ultimate goal is to be a head coach in the National Hockey League. So he has Triple A or the AHL left. Then after the AHL, then you got the NHL. Um, Dirk Graham, pictured right here, uh, became the first black head coach in the NHL in 1998-99 but he was fired by the Chicago Blackhawks after his first season. Um, since then, there has not been another head coach of color nor of African descent in the National Hockey League. Payne has been a member of the NHL Coaches Association, Bi 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 BIPOC program aimed to support minority coaches, was invited to speak at the organization's global clinic this May. Payne said that the speaking engagement opened up new opportunities he was able to interview with several ECHL and AHL clubs during the offseason. Um, Thomas initially brought play with him to Cincinnati in 2018, and he rose through the ranks, became the assistant head coach. In their two seasons together, the Cyclones' record was 89 30 and 12 with four draws and qualified for the postseason twice. Um, Thomas was named in 2019 ECHL Coach of the Year. Um, the Cyclones were also led by Christine Rock, who was the only woman to serve as a general manager in the ECHL, AHL or NHL. She stated she didn't want Jason to get attention for the wrong reasons, meaning because he's black. She wanted him to get attention because he deserves the job. And once this is almost kind of sad that we're in 2021, she stated, he's the only black head coach in pro hockey a game that black people invented and it rattles me. It really, it's really a shame. It was amazing. She stated because I love the fact that NHL was extremely transparent. They're basically saying we need to work on this. We're really white and we can't be, that's not what the general population is. So it didn't make sense for us to be that way. The NHL is also losing traction with other pro sports in the United States. So there are ulterior motives to diversify. Payne said his coaching style, excuse me. Um, Payne stated that his coaching style was centered around understanding his players as people and advocating that way so they can get better out of them on the ice. Um, the Cyclones will be his first head coaching job. He will continue to serve as the team's director of hockey operations and work for the Cincinnati Cyclones Foundation on which he was a strong component of that went out in the community and tried to grow the game in the greater Cincinnati area, which included Northern Kentucky. Uh, while he was playing, Payne stated he wasn't a natural goal scorer. Remember, we talked about him on that first uh, black line in the AHL, um, but he just worked really hard. He was physical, and he fought every chance he could um, on and off the ice. I knew he, he said he knew how hard it was to play pro hockey for 14 years, and to try to make the NHL, so he wants to extend that to his players. Um, he said he only made it to the AHL or Triple A, but it fought hard to get there. So why would he not as fight as hard to coach? 
Uh, when he was younger, he would call people calling him the N word in minor league hockey, saying he didn't even know what it was, but it made him feel weird and isolated. Um, that same pause he had as a child, he had during a game recently that the Cincinnati played in, um, um, or a game in Virginia. Um, uh, he was being called, uh, you know, the N word and other racial epithet, epithets on the ice. And after the game, uh, you know, in the minor leagues, it might be a dual locker room. So the guy that was, uh, you know, trying to ridicule him, he ran down the hallway and was going to get into a brawl. Uh, but then he realized, or as he stated, that, uh, you know, security ended up breaking it up. But, you know, he was in Virginia, and if he escalated it more, then he'd probably be isolated by his own team as well. Um, again, Payne, he grew up playing other sports in toronto including hockey and once he got to start playing hockey he had to fight for his respect because again even though the origins are african based most people don't know that so it's known as a european game but that's not the case so um he was a multi-sport athlete growing up um even in high school he had division one football scholarships in america um along with his schedule of playing hockey but uh, at one point, he rolled his uh, ankle when he was deciding whether he's going to go play Division One football or go to the hockey minor leagues. And when he rolled his ankle, he was out of football and hockey for a couple of days. The OHL called him and knew it was his time to prioritize, and he got paid to play hockey. So he spent 14 years in the NHL, which was probably a great decision. Um, at 21, he was called up to an IHL team in Michigan and he really began his pro career from there. Um, this past July, we also saw two former NHL players join a pro coaching fraternity. The New Jersey Devils uh, tapped retired right ring Mike Greer to be assistant head coach. Uh, Mike Greer is the son of Rosie Greer, um, uh, NH, excuse me, NFL veteran. Um, so again, we're starting to see this, but we need more diversity. Uh, so we need people like you guys to watch Sports 101 as well as Sports Zone Chicago to put the word out that this is a great game invented by Africans. Uh, once we play it, we put an entertaining style on the ice and it should be pushed in our communities. Um, in closing, how do we do that? We have to teach the history of the game and that will help, although not appreciated by the majority fan base, it is true. And eventually our youth will see that and we would get more numbers. Now, obviously, we're not going to get as much as football or basketball or even baseball, but we want to increase and take a little bit out of each. If you see what soccer is doing now in the United States, they're growing in popularity because they're including um, different styles of play that um, are a preference to minorities. And then we look at soccer and we look at the paper bowl of demarcation in 1492, how Portugal went to Angola and took millions to Brazil and dropped them off. And henceforth, we got this Samba, Capoeira, uh, Yoga Benito, Brazilian soccer style that again comes with a strong African influence. Also, we must know that seeing is believing. If more people of African descent were taught the history of hockey, more simply would play. Lastly, we must look at the style of play. Many of the coaches of African descent teach a precision skating style that brings a flair and grace to the game instead of dump and chase hockey, which is taught in Europe and other places. I remember I used to love when the Blackhawks would get together, they would take the puck from behind the net and come out and sweep. The, the Red Wings would do that as well. So I love that, you know, style of hockey. I hate dump and chase. Um, is not stylistic and again we saw other sports in, in america grow when not only they integrated but when they changed the style of play when college and professional football allow um, africans to come in and they uh, took the best from historically black colleges along with the television and the forward pass uh, football uh, grew when uh, basketball integrated and the harlem globe trotters and texas western came out and were beating kentucky and uh uh, James McClendon at North Carolina, the North Carolina Central University, developed a fast break offense in the four corners. Um, that's when basketball came about. Um, even even soccer, when you look at that globally, all the European nations uh, getting players of African descent 
trying to play a more wide open style. Every sport does that. And once the NHL embraces that, it too will rise. Um, again, in closing, I hope you guys loved uh, today's show, Soul on Ice, the African-American experience in the NHL. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Sports 101. I'm your host, Jamar Harp. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Coach underscore Harp 412 and Facebook under the name Jamar Harp. Get social with Sports 101 and a litany of other Sports on Chicago shows by following Sports on Chicago on Twitter at Sports on CHI, Facebook at Sports on Chicago, and Instagram at Sports on Chicago. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, search Sports on Chicago, but more importantly, download the Sports on Chicago app. The Sports on Chicago app can be found on our iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon stores. Again, thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Sports 101. I'll see you next week at our normally scheduled time of 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. And I'm gone.